Welcome to Play by Play Podcast, your passport to untold stories of the beautiful game. My name is Patrick Bergman. And my name is Ahmed Ehrim. This is where we're going to tell you about all the untold stories of the beautiful game inside the football and outside the football plays abroad and within the UK, within the game and outside the game, including business. Well, you look like you just came back from the Maldives or Bali Bali with that shit fresh up. Let's go, bro. Look. Hey, Joseph. Hi, welcome. How is the weather in How Texas? It's hard. It's hard here. Uh-huh. Let me see. It's about, <laughs> I'm sure it's about 80 degrees now. Mm. It's hard here in Texas high. right now. 83 degrees. Yes, I was right. It got it got to the hundreds like two days ago. So, my name is Ahmed. We've got Patrick over here. Welcome to Play by Play podcast, where we bring people like yourself who are ambitious, who had a sporting background, and we're trying to see how they transfer them that skill and that upbringing into a successful life, whether it be in the sport or outside the sport or entrepreneur life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm gonna start off. Okay, um, tell us about your life from a young kid to where you got now tell us about your journey well growing up uh my dad always instilled in us that competitive nature he used to challenge us to be the top 10 in the class i remember a phrase he used to make he used to say the people who top the class they don't have two heads they're human beings (laughs) like you you know they work hard and they study to be the best so don't just get average and said okay i didn't feel any cause i scored 50 percent and above so i'm all right that's not okay because you if you get to a better place where you have more challenging people you might end up failing so he used to challenge us right from childhood to always be good in education and sports for life he played uh, table tennis also competitively uh which is called ping pong and he mm. played tennis too and it was a good swim although i don't swim i played a uh, basketball in college I didn't make it in soccer. I wasn't good in soccer. I could never make the soccer <laughs> team, you know. But I played soccer in college just as the goalkeeper only. Uh-huh, because mm. I could get balls and all that, especially penalties, you know. I could <laughs> cover most of the posts because of my size and all that. So I played mm. uh, soccer as a goalkeeper in college. And I played basketball and uh, sports and also chess. So that competitive nature was instilled to us in our childhood from my dad when he was still alive. My dad was a banker and he always strived to be the best. You know, honest mm-hmm. way, what he did, and it is his banking, his field of banking that gave him that entrepreneurial spirit because he saw what was moving the kind of businesses that were helping people back in Africa. So he now saw what he could have invest in when he retired. You know, mm-hmm. so that's the kind of background I have. I always had that kind of competitive nature, and he instilled in us the the zeal to go and try out stuff. You know, try out IT. You know get into technology and all that. And that helped us a lot. All my brothers and all my siblings were all, were all into IT. I'm the first of mm. my siblings. So I started that out in 2002. I started out with the Microsoft Certified Professional Certification. And right then I started building myself, you know, getting into web design and doing stuff with technology. And now I've been in the U.S. for since 2016. So that should be eight years now. And I'm always trying to look back to see what I can do for people in Africa and how I can make an impact different from everybody else. So that's just a brief mm. history about me right now. How do you use your competitive nature in uh, your professional life? It's very, very helpful because it helps you to work across diverse teams in a collaborative nature, to be able to understand people's strengths and weaknesses and, you know, and be able to merge them together. Because that's what happens when you're in sports. Everybody's not going to be the same person like you. People play with aggression. Others play on a mellow, you know. Others can come into the pitch and trash everybody without training, you know. So mm. that's how sports is. Somebody can come, especially in basketball. There's some people, they're always going to hit that three-pointer, even if they don't train. You can't stop them. Others are always going to mm. dunk on you. So sports help me a lot in business to have that collaborative nature when you're dealing with different, diverse people and to have that... Um, competitive nature to always have that grit, consistency, discipline. Sports helps a lot in discipline. In business and entrepreneurial stuff, you have to be disciplined because things are not going to go that way. There's ups and downs, you know, especially when it comes to finances, staffs getting laid off and the economy. So sports helps to instill that discipline in you to be able to competitive in nature and a collaborative nature with diverse teams. Apart from competitiveness, 
is there any other traits or um, the characteristics that you took from sport that you transferred it onto your business and entrepreneurship? Yes, 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 of course. Uh, teamwork. Teamwork and greed. Great is persistence. You know, you keep on persisting, even if it seems as if you're not getting the results that you want, especially in sports. You might not make it to the finals, but you keep on persisting. You come back, you train harder next year. The same thing in business. You might not get that amount of customers you have. You will never get them when you're starting out, especially when you're doing business in Africa. Africa, mm -hmm. doing business in Africa is a different ball game than America. It's totally different because in Africa, you don't have access to the kind of credit system you have in America. People are buying stuff, they're mainly in cash. It's not online. There's no credit system base. You can, for example, now you want to buy an iPhone. You can have a five-year payment for it here in the U.S., you know? You can help them to mm. sell more. In Africa, you got to buy cash. Nobody's going to mm. give you a five-year payment for a phone or a car and all those stuff. So it's much different doing business in Africa than here in America where people have access to credit and all that. So you have to find mm. out creative ways of having that greed and uh, having teamwork to always stick with it to the end, just like in sports. Even if you're not making it to the finals, you've got to train harder, you know, try to learn for it, continuous learning and come back better, you know, to get on your feet. What led you to web design? Uh, it's kind of like, I started off uh, just being curious about IT and I looked at it and I, and later on I'm like, wow, hmm. Businesses want to market stuff. The internet was just coming up when I said IT in the 90s. And I was like, okay, so you can get your business across to a whole lot more people than the traditional means of marketing and advertising that cost a lot. TV, radio, billboards, cost you millions. But if you can put up a decent website and get a following, you can get much more people to get your products and services to on a much cheaper and scale faster. So that led me to say, okay, let me see if I can help business to achieve their business needs. Not thinking about profit, but like making a, a, a name for yourself. And I, in sales, I did what is called upsell. Like, for example, if I build a website with, for you, I could upsell you uh, complimentary card printing services. I'm going to print your brochure. I'm going to print some flyers for you to market, you know. I'm going to do some other publishing stuff to help your business grow. So that's what helped me to be able to retain a lot of my clients because I wasn't just doing one one service for them. I was doing several services for them, not just the web design, printing, marketing, and all that, publishing, like calendars, annual calendars, diaries you hand out to your top clients and all that. So I was doing that too. After being a successful salesperson yourself, what, what would you advise someone that is an upcoming, let's say they are working nine to five, they want to get out of that, out of that, that race, let's say, where they kind of just um trading their time yeah, for working money. On the treadmill. Yeah. yeah, working on the treadmill, like yeah, a hamster on the wheel. Yeah. yeah, and they want to get out of that system, and they want to provide va uh, value for money instead. Yeah. Okay, but how? What would you advise for that type, them type of people that want to start that life? as a salesperson or as an entrepreneur, what would you advise for them? I advise them first and foremost, you have to love what you do. You have to really want to make an impact and not think about profit in the in the beginning because you're not going to get profit straight out, no matter how good you are. Mm. You have to find your niche like me now. I'm, despite the fact that I publish a lot of books, I'm not good with graphics. So I always have to get freelancers to handle those graphical aspects for me, you know? But if it's the technical aspect, okay, I was okay, this is how we can do this. But the graphical aspect, graphic design and all those stuff, I have to get someone else. And you have to think about the impact you're making on the society, not just making profit or making money. You know, because especially you have to have a system in place. Because if you really love something and you're doing it to help businesses, it will help you to have that grit and perseverance to keep on going, even though you don't have as much clients as you have. And you have to think differently. Like, for example, I'll give you a good example. In Africa now, the way people do business, they try to model after America. Oh, I want to be like Amazon. I want to be like eBay. That's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. Why? Most of the people who are buying stuff from this Amazon and all that, there's a logistic system in place. Same day shipping, uh, Amazon Prime, uh, Amazon credit card system, Amazon, you know, there's a system in place that's not there in Africa. You can achieve that because 
you are building a lot of the resources yourself. People are not buying. You don't have that buying power like in the U.S. in Africa. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. The buying power is just not there. You know, so you have to think differently and find your niche for the people that you're going to sell to and scale at your own pace and not try to model after. A lot of startups, most of the startups coming up in Africa right now, they are just doing finance, meaning, oh, a lot of people are transferring money from the diaspora all over the world back to Africa. So they say, okay, let's just build a portal that can handle your money exchange transfer mm -hmm. back to Africa. We take some few pennies and some few uh, profit from it. That's not really making a big impact, you know, mm -hmm. because the, uh, for you to make a big impact, Africa has a wealth of knowledge, very intelligent people that come out to the UK, Europe, the US, and they excel. I was, yeah, there are people that like, there was two girls here, they're African-American anyway, they broke a mathematical uh, theorem that has not been solved in over 100 years. There's a girl now that has become a PhD graduate at 17 years old, you know, so... Mm -hmm. You have to think about ways of doing things for Africa that's going to help the generation to build because Africa, unfortunately, is highly import-oriented. We're bringing most of the stuff, like in my country, coming from China. You know, stuff you can produce there. The glasses I'm wearing, China. You can produce this there. You know, clothes, you know, coming from the printed, then they bring it to the U.S. and ship it to other places. You know, I work at Amazon, and a lot of stuff we have is coming in from China, but it's coming to the U.S., uh, companies then they're shipping it out and upping the price you'd be amazed you might be buying the nike sneakers for 300 dollars but it's made for 50 dollars in china you know mm. that's how mm -hmm. these companies kill so africa has to think different the way india thinks different about outsourcing india has got it right india and china uh, most of the chips are made in asia that were used for all these are laptops all these are phones they're not produced in the u.s you know so that's something that is a big industry that is not going away anytime soon Unless the world wakes up to say, okay, we're not going to allow these chips and all this memory stuff to be produced in Asia. We're going to produce there. So that is how I feel. You have to think different. First and foremost, you have to have a system in place, a framework. You have to genuinely want to help your clients find your niche and know that's going to be hard. You're not going to make that money. You're not going in for money basis. You're going in because you want to add value to their life and make an impact in the industry. That's how I feel. What's the thing that people get wrong when it comes to Africa? Oh, like the common belief. Yeah, common belief you, is that we yeah. don't speak English. We don't speak English. When I talk, people say, oh, how do you understand English? You know, one of these days I'm going to tell them I learned it on the plane here. We learn so fast that I listen to the pilot and that's how I'm able to speak English. <laughs> you know? In my country, English is the official language. We have over 200 million people there. English is what is taught in schools. In fact, I don't even know my native language. I don't know how to speak it. I know some of the greetings, the general greetings, but I know some other languages better than my own lady language. English is what is taught in school. In, in some countries in Africa, like Cameroon and Kenya, you have both English and French. You have the Francophone areas, you have the Anglophone, and you have so, a lot of people from Cameroon and Kenya can speak English and French fluently, you know, mm. Mm. separate from their uh, native dialect. But a lot of people in the U.S. and all over the world think, oh, we're not speaking English in Africa. We're just speaking our native language. It's wrong. Because a lot of Africa was colonized by the British, Spain, Portugal, and several other people, you know? Mm. So even some parts of Africa, they speak Spanish, you know? Mm. People don't realize that. So that's mm. a common uh, misconception people have that we are not speaking English in Africa, which is totally wrong, I can tell you that, you know? And what, what's the expectations you had when you came to USA? And did the expectations happen or it was completely different as you thought it is? Uh, everybody has expectations based on what you see when you get here. Oh, uh, the land of the American dream and all that, you know. Once you come and you put in your best, you're going to just achieve what you're going to do fast. Within two, three years, you're going to do this, that, that. No, no, no. It's a whole different ball game, you know. America being a capitalist society is much more different than people expect. And there's a lot of stereotypes, you know, especially in jobs and business-wise and all that. So you really have to find your niche. But it's still a good place because it allows everybody to thrive once you have a good idea and you can implement it with enough patience and time to get your niche, you know. So that's what I saw. The expectation I got was not what I found, but I'm sticking with it and I'm learning every day, you know. And it's a, it's a great opportunity. America is a land of opportunity because you get a lot of resources for learning free that you wouldn't get in Africa. You know, 
Like, for example, you get a lot of places you can get internet for free, get training programs that are tailored to you for free, for you to get skill sets that you can use to make a livelihood, you know, mm. that you don't get in Africa at all, you know. So it's, 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 it's really good, but uh, they're not where they're supposed to be as accommodating everybody as I feel, but they're getting there. You've mentioned providing value for a business, or like for some niches, like a high silk high ticket sales or whatever it may be or closing deals or whatever it may be or being the middleman or whatever it may be. What's the difference between providing a value for the customer and providing a value uh, to a high business end in terms of like a an investor or in terms of like closing deals or whatever it may be? Um what's the difference between to like a singular approach and what's the difference between to a like a general marketing approach where you're attacking for more towards the masses well it depends on your demographics of the people you are trying to sell your service or your product to what i normally do before i even take up that kind of stuff to deal with the client is that do you have a market for your product are you there because you really want to serve people? Like I'll give an example, building websites. A lot of people is competitive in Africa because a lot of people offer very cheap websites. Then they pay off people in India to do what is called like clickbait. They can tell you, okay, pay me like a thousand dollars for marketing and I'll give you 3000 likes on your website. Where are they getting those likes from? It's not from Africa, <laughs> you know? They pay for it to some firms in India. And then I'm just telling you, this is like the underground stuff they do. They pay some firm in India. And before you know what, boom, within 24 hours, they got a thousand likes on your website. And the person in Africa is saying, wow, he got me a thousand likes within 24 hours. That's not going to help your business to scale because those people are not going to buy your products or services, especially if you're only serving the local community there in Africa. But your website will be showing you have 2,000 likes or 10,000 likes and all that. And I see that when I was consulting for bills, they were like, oh, how can you get me 10,000 likes within one week? Did I say, no, 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 no. That's not how you do websites, you know? You really have to have a value you want to add and you have to scale. You have to do the market research. Look at where your people are going on online, how they are buying. Most people, 90% of the people in Africa, they're not dealing with laptops like this. They are dealing with the internet on their phones. So if you are building websites for them, it has to be mobile friendly and it has to be what we call um, progressive web, web apps. Progressive websites are apps that are like lean websites that load faster. They are not heavy like the website we have in America and Europe there because you have broadband, you have faster internet. The internet in Africa is slower. So if you're building a website for them, it has to be faster. It has to be less lean website, clean website that doesn't have a lot of stuff. Integration that you have in, in, um, in Europe and in America. So... When I'm dealing with clients on that approach, I try to find out how is this going to scale? Are you selling to the middle class, the upper class, or the lower class? GSM is a good example. When GSM came to Africa in late 90s, they thought they were going to sell to the upper class, you know? They were marketing, marketing to the upper class, but they don't understand the mentality of the African guy. The African guy will go and take half of his paycheck just to go and buy that phone to show off to his co-workers. You know, so before the new one, a lot of people from the low class were buying this expensive phone. A phone might be just twenty dollars in the U.S., but when you transfer it to the currency of the people, there's a little bit above middle class. You know, and people were like, "No, I'm gonna take my my half of my paycheck to buy this phone. I'm gonna borrow money, buy it, and I'm gonna use it for the next two, three, four, five years." You know, that's what made the GSM explosion, the phone mobile phone explosion, so large in Africa because a lot of people that they thought were poor. We're getting all these phones, you know, and they're like, whoa, there's a market there. And everybody started going there. Oh, let's go sell phones. Let's go sell cell phones. Let's go sell mobile phones. Let's go sell stuff, you know? So that is the way mm -hmm. that you see that you just look at the situation. If you have a good product that people are using for convenience and they saw that the phone was good for convenience, it's much better than landlines and all that. It helps you transact better. That actually explodes. So those companies really have to look at the market you're going after and the value you're giving to them. A mistake a lot of them make that ends, ends up letting them to pull out is that if you come in expensive right off the bat, you're not going to get it. You have to come in at the middle class level, you know? 
at the level that the middle class can afford and the poor people can afford, then you can scale and go expensive. But if you come in, there's no product to serve the middle class or the lower, you're not going to get that market. Because like I said, there's no credit system there. There's no credit system there. And you're not going to have access to loans and all that as easily as you do in America and all these places in, the, in the Europe. Where did you get your knowledge from? Did you have any mentors or did you learn from your own mistakes? Uh, I read books a lot. I love reading. I, I, love, I read books a lot and I always try to be different from everybody else. Like I have projects that I'm trying to handle right now and stuff I'm trying to do in Africa that is going to be different from what everybody else is doing. I'm not interested in building an app for people to send money to Africa. That doesn't help the impact of the youth there. There are a lot of, my, my country has like 70% youth. 70% youth in my country you could, and a population of over 200 million. And a lot of them are smart without jobs because the economy cannot sustain the, it's not, it's not mature enough to create jobs for those people. So you have to find a way of bringing stuff that can help them learn to contribute to the society. There are people designing stuff. There's a guy in my country who built a car. You know, he didn't go to college. He just went to one of those technical schools, you know, and he's building stuff. There's somebody that built like a transformer. I saw the videos on YouTube right in my country to help in, in, in electricity generation and all this stuff. You know, people need that kind of an incentive to do stuff. And unfortunately, the government is not really helping as they should. They're still interested in just bringing in foreign stuff and materials and all that. But you can build stuff for the environment there. You know, and that's what I'm looking at to empower the people so that they can get something. There. Africa is still a large market, a big market. The Chinese are there, the Indians are there, the Europeans are there. There's a big market right there in Africa that is not going away. You know, and they are very, very skillful people, knowledgeable people that pick up stuff fast. That's why when they come to America, you see them, they get degrees, PhD fast, and you see them going into entrepreneurial spirit and doing well with it, you know? So mm. that's the way I see it. I learned a lot from what I learned in books. And when I got to the U.S., getting into trying to get into tech sales, I got some mentors that helped me on the sales aspect on how to handle stuff and all that. But I've been doing the business consulting since 2007 when I founded uh, AMDG Consulting. But prior to that, I'd worked at several uh, places in, 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 in Africa, in my country. So... That mm -hmm. really that really helped me. I, I, I learned from all the places I worked. I had a boss who was in the media industry, Patrick Oke by name, and uh, he really helped me a lot because that was when I learned how to craft stuff. I learned about book publishing. I learned about, you know, media stuff. You know, it really helped me a lot in the media stuff when I worked mm -hmm. with him for like six years. Yeah, six years. We did a lot of book publishing then. We crafted a lot of scripts for TV shows and he did stuff online on TV and all that. And it really helped me to build me, you know. As you know, that I've started to look into Amazon FBA, something okay. that you're into as well. Okay. Um, from being an MG consultant business, going into Amazon FBA, why did they make that transition? How's that transition going? Um, tell us more about your, your journey in Amazon. Right now in, in Amazon, I got into the U.S. trying to break into, I first started trying to break into the cybersecurity industry. You know, I couldn't get that. Then from then, I now started looking at sales. But when I found tech sales, I know I'm like, uh oh, this looks like something I've been doing in Africa already. You know, I've been marketing stuff for people and publishing books and marketing their books and selling their books for them you know and all that mm -hmm. and uh, during covid covid struck i've been in amazon in the logistic department at sat one since 2020 when covid struck all mm -hmm. companies as you know a lot of them were shut down for like three four months but amazon was thriving then and hiring people you know and they were making the biggest sales and you know their products were going hot so i joined them there 2020 like okay it's like <laughs> all these other businesses. I was in you know, in a Toyota a supplier then. I left them. They shut down. They said, oh, we're going to shut down. I said, okay, no, I'm not coming back because I don't think they're going to be able to recover that much after COVID. So 
I went to Amazon then in 2020 during COVID and uh, I've been there. So that makes it five years now. And, you know, they're thriving. Amazon has a different approach from uh, putting their products out there and the services than everybody else. If you can remember, I don't know how old you guys are. Amazon started with books, only books. That's what they started mm -hmm. with, only mm -hmm. books. Then I used to check online and see their books when I was in Africa and all that. It was very expensive to get a book all the way from the U.S. to Africa. So I just used to check out their books online. They started out with only books and they built their platform for handling their website then on the books and use that platform to get into the cloud. That is how they came into the Amazon cloud services, which they are they own like 40% of the cloud services. You know, they looked at their platform and said, okay, we could use this and build this online, you know, and do stuff and get our cloud services going and all that. So it's 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 been nice and uh it's, it's a learning experience i'm still learning every day being in amazon and i hope to learn more wherever i i, I take myself from there wherever the next journey in my life takes me but I'm, I'm still trying to build something both in the u.s here some projects here and in nigeria what's your best moment in life your highlight the one that you can tell me right now what was that oh i think the highlight of my life was um was getting married in 2010. Was it 2010? I hope my wife doesn't get married. 2010, yeah, 2010. Yeah. She's not going to be a I'm saying it's the best highlight because me, I have a weakness. I I don't have a good work-life balance. Mm. If I'm working, I'm the kind of person I'll go to work, finish my nine to five, come home with my laptop and still be doing stuff, you know? Oh, call this mm. person, do that. And people will be yelling at me, look, I'm I'm with I'm at table with my wife. I don't want to talk anything, but I'm like that. But when I met my wife, she was like, no, 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 no. You have to structure your time. You know, I know that this work, let it end there. Don't allow your clients to call you outside business hours. If you tell them, I'm not going to pick a call at 7 p.m. and all that, no matter what, it's never emergency. Do that and have a system for yourself that you can have time for life outside work and spend time with your family spend time with sports you know and all this stuff because when i really got into business and consulting i just give up sports i'm not going to play basketball i'm not going to play chess i don't have time let me not do this business when i do this business i'm going to make this money i'm going to do that i'm going to make this impact for my clients but it didn't work out that way so i had to sit down and say okay i'm having burnout how am i going to get over this family sports you know an outlet for you to relieve yourself from the stressful situations of work. You know, you have to really get that balance for you to be a healthy person on the whole, on a, a whole round way, not just on one way, way. You know, it helps you psychologically, emotionally, and all that. It makes you a better person at work when you have that connection with uh, family and a form of recreation, you know, easing out. A lot of times it's, it's, it's helpful because you might have a business problem at work Spending time, extra one or two hours after work might not solve it. But you get back home, you relax, you sleep on it. When you get back to work the next day, you'll be like, oh, I'm energized, I'm going to do this. But if you come back mm -hmm. home, you bring it back home, you're thinking about it, worrying about it, especially when it comes to stuff like designing, you know? Mm -hmm. When you're designing stuff in graphics and all that and designing stuff, you can't, you can't just force it. You just have to wait and let it come. And it will definitely come when you, you step back and try and relax and do something else. It comes back, you know. But we get carried away because in Africa, unfortunately, when you're doing business, you're building a lot of infrastructure yourself. Meaning you own an office, you're going to have a generator. You're going to be buying gasoline and running that generator for the time you're working. You might drill a borehole to get water in your office and all that. So all the stuff gets in your head. Like, oh, I have to do this to generate. It's not like America that you just pay your bill, you have your water, your light. 24 7 you know africa is different you're going to run that gas you're going to buy gas to run stuff you're going to drill a ball for water and all that you're going to be in traffic for hours in africa you can be in traffic easily for two hours heading to work in a place that shouldn't take you more than 15 minutes to go to work if the road is free you know so that's how i see it it's it's the greatest point in my life i think is getting into marriage and not trying to live the bachelor life and burnout. And my wife helped me to focus. I learned a lot from my mentors and from all the places I work, 
but they never gave me a balance of uh, work-life balance, you know, home life and all that. So she helped me with that, and that helped me to be what I am today, to really focus and not get burned out and keep on progressing in my business and struggling my time, following systems and frameworks. I have a system, time frameworks and all that, and I follow it on a daily basis. That's how I'm able to juggle working at Amazon, doing AMDG consulting and doing other stuff for people, you know? And so that's it. But unfortunately, I haven't brought out time. I haven't played sports that much since I got in the U.S. I really mm -hmm. have time to go out and shoot some basketball somewhere. I don't want to get embarrassed because <laughs> <laughs> these young kids will just dunk on me. <laughs> <laughs> You should definitely try it though. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask a deep question. Okay. So for me, what's your why? What's your purpose? What gets you up in the morning and be like, right, like, this is my end goal, this is where I need to be. What's your drive? My drive is like I will go back to the beginning, how I got into IT. I was waiting for my college results uh, application in Africa so that I could get into college. And I just went into an IT training school just to learn about a computer. My dad bought a computer to my school. Let me just learn about it so that I can do stuff and help my dad. And a lady there said, this guy, you, you have a flair for this stuff. I said, how? He said, well, we did this stuff and you're at the top of the class. And we've been using this stuff before you. But you just came and you kind of like learned it easily. So you have a passion for it. You have a flair for it. And I've seen that a lot with my clients, especially the book publishing industry. When I do stuff and I design with them, I'm not thinking much about the profit, but the impact, which is going to make. This is how I look into it. Okay, I'm going to get the cost of production of this book, get the cost of marketing, get the cost of this. Okay, as long as I'm not going to run a loss, I'm going to publish this thing for them and make sure that they can outsell so that they can get more prints. That's my business mindset. Some people were like, oh, let me just mark them up, make all the money, and if they don't call me back, I don't care. But they come back and say, wow, we expected to sell 5,000 copies of this book. We sold 10,000. Please come back. Even if you charge double, we're going to still <laughs> use you because we made this amount of profit. We're able to reach these people because of your business acumen of marketing the stuff out online. Marketing stuff online is not about making ads. Like I said, it's getting the right demographic, the people who have the buying power, the financial impact to be able to purchase that stuff, who have a need for it and really giving them value. And when you give them value, what happens is viral marketing. People are going to spread news about your product online and you will need to be paying for ads, you know. And the drive that gives me that is that a lot of my clients have told me that, uh, oh, you did this well. You're not thinking much about the a money aspect of making much money because they know what people charge for the services. And when you charge less, even though you're still making profit, they're like, they really appreciate it. And I feel that I have to really make an impact in the world different from anybody else whenever I leave this earth, you know? An impact meaning they're not going to say, oh, this guy was a millionaire or a billionaire, but this guy raised people up to be themselves, to make an impact in society, to get a means of livelihood, you know, to be able to take care of their families and to make their own, you know, impact in the society. It's important that you make an impact in the society. That's what gets me up every day. Even when I go to work, I'm thinking of things I want to do in Africa. I'm thinking about an impact in the society that is going to help generations to come, not just about profit for today. I say we have to make money from it and all that. Money will come. If you work hard and you really want to help people do something, the money will come. Because you're going to create quality and value, business value that's going to drive return on interest for them. So that's my mm. drive. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry for breaking the podcast. Just one announcement, okay? Check out our channels on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook, Play by Play Podcast. I have so many questions that I would like to ask you, but unfortunately, we have three minutes left. So okay. I I had to choose the, the best one, the best one in my opinion. So what's your advice to young African people that are talented, would you advise them to move abroad or would you advise them to stay in their country and develop the country as well with their talent? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. I would advise young people who have talents, depending on the reason why you're moving abroad. Some people come here for college, do their masters and go back. 
but you have to think about the impact you want to make. Are you comfortable living abroad? I know a lot of young people, they're not comfortable living abroad. They want to be there in Africa and make the money, do stuff, outsourcing and all that. They want to develop from Africa, build websites and do stuff. So it depends on your reasons. I feel most people, most Africans will tell you, giving their own choices that I want to stay in Africa. If the society is good, I want to stay in Africa because you can't beat the environment, the weather and all that. I want to stay there and really, if you have money in Africa, you're really comfortable. You know, it's not like America that a lot of taxes will even come to you the more you make. It's not like that in Africa, you know. So a lot of people, I'll tell them, it depends on the reason why you're going. You have to, you can come here and get the education, go back and develop there. If you feel you don't want to have anything to do with Afri Africa again, you want to relocate here, it doesn't work well that. Because you're always going to be a second class citizen when you are abroad. It doesn't matter if you make a billion dollars or you make $10 billion, you're always a second class citizen to the society. So they have to think about that. It's not what you see on TV. You're not going to come here and everybody's going to be worshipping you. No. In America here, there are neighborhoods you're not going to be able to go to, no matter how much money you have. You know, there are special neighborhoods for people. You, No matter how much money you have, you're never going to be able to go there. So they have to think that. And mm -hmm. How are you going to handle discrimination? How are you going to handle your kids? How are your kids going to handle discrimination? How are you going to build a culture for them? Culture is important. It's important in Africa. It's important everywhere, even in Europe. A lot of the Western nations have lost their culture, but you have to think about what do you, legacy do you want to leave behind? Everybody at the end of the day, even if they want to settle abroad, they all think about moving back home when they are old to come and live the rest of their days. So you have to think about the impact. Get the education, get the knowledge, but build Africa because it's always your home. East or West Africa is the home. Beautiful. What's the next step for you? What's your, your future plans? Yeah, I'm still working on my some i don't have time to talk about it i'm working on some projects right now and i hope they'll come into fruition before the end of the year for africa um, while i'm here oof. ah thank you so much for coming thank on. you uh, joseph thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure yeah pleasure it's here been too. so much knowledge and uh, we appreciate you coming on and we'll love it to have you again in the future wow that was an episode if you want to see more check out this one